Buckshot Roulette is one of the most unique and immersive takes on the horror game genre, and I'd like to talk about what makes it so good. It's easy to tell that a lot of thought was put into making this game, and I wanted to shed some light on just how much work this game got, starting with... The gameplay is actually surprisingly deep and interesting, considering how it's just Russian Roulette, but with items. But the game's depth doesn't sacrifice its simplicity. Every item is easy to understand, and all the items are completely centered around the decision of shooting the dealer or yourself. The way the game keeps its simplicity is by having a kind of one-at-a-time design. Every item will only do one thing at a time. Let's talk about what these items actually do. Adding to its simplicity, there are only five items the magnifying glass, the cigarettes, the knife, the handcuffs, and the beard. Every item has its own unique silhouette that helps distinguish them from a glance, as well as having distinct effects that can be used very easily in simple situations, but the complexity forms from the combination of these items and the rest of the mechanics of the game. The simplest item is the cigarette. It regenerates your health. Not in real life. Uh, don't smoke, you'll, you'll get lung cancer. But even an item this simple can be used in complex ways. You can use it in combination with handcuffs to shoot yourself with no risk as a kind of diet beer, knowing that even if it hits, you can just heal up right after. But other uses are very situational, so you really only just use it to heal yourself. The second simplest item is the knife. It makes the shotgun do two damage. The reason why this item is more complex than the cigarettes is that it includes the decision of not using it. You need to take the risk and assess the odds in order to be sure that you'll hit the next shot, which isn't the case for the cigarettes. It combines well with stuff that decreases or increases the odds, like the magnifying glass, which shows you the next bullet in the chamber. The decision of using it or not is a lot more important because of how useful knowing what's next in the chamber is to the game. It also combines very easily with the rest of the items, just from the fact that it reduces the risk of making decisions. The second most complex item is the handcuffs. These allow an extra turn. The handcuffs easily combine with every item and are extremely versatile, for as versatile as a Russian roulette game can get. Along with maybe the magnifying glass, I'd say this is the most OP item in the game. The handcuffs can single-handedly, or I guess double-handed, finish an entire round, either by you winning or skipping the dealer's turn entirely. Could also just be like me and just get shot two times. And surprisingly, the most complex item is the beer can. Don't get me wrong, it is objectively the worst item. But it has a lot more going for it than it seems. The most simple situation to use it in is in a 1 to 1 bullet ratio, so that you, at the very least, don't get shot and receive new items for the next round. I also use it to shift the odds one way or the other since I don't really like 50-50s. It's helpful to just shift the odds in any direction so you can be more sure about what you can do next. But the real complexity comes from... Most people see the beer as just a worse magnifying glass, and while that is true, it does something that the magnifying glass can't. It can skip live rounds. Why would that be useful? Because you aren't the only one able to shoot live rounds. Eventually, your turn will end, and it will be the dealer's turn. Let's consider the situation where there are two live rounds left, and it's your turn. Bearing the first live round is the best decision in the situation because the dealer cannot play on his turn since there will only be one shot left for you to shoot. You get a guaranteed shot and don't get shot yourself. But the beer is useful for more complicated situations that involve the dealer's items. The same items that I've already explained have even more complexity when they are at the hands of the dealer. Dealer cigarettes force you to find a way to finish the round quickly. That could mean killing him and winning the round, but it could also mean skipping his turn. If you can guarantee a hit, but you know he'll survive it and has cigarettes, it might be better to find a way to get rid of all the shells by bearing any live rounds, making sure it's never his turn. If the bealer has strong item combinations like magnifying glasses and a knife, it's better to find a way to end the round than get an extra shot off before his next turn. Knives are more interesting when in the dealer's hands. Let's look at a situation where there is one live round and two blanks. You could just try to shoot him and hope that it hits. 
but when it's his turn, he shoots you for two charges. But there is a way to guarantee that you don't lose. You do it by repeatedly choosing yourself. The reason why is that worst case scenario, you lose one charge instead of two and survive to the next round, assuming you have more than one charge. For the magnifying glass, the main way to use this item against the dealer is by letting him waste it. The dealer's AI is very simple. If it's not the last bullet, he does a coin toss. But before he shoots, he will always use all of his items, meaning that if you know that there are only blanks left, when you give him the gun, the dealer has no idea. So he will just waste every item he has until the last bullet or he misses trying to shoot you. And a situation like this makes not using handcuffs the best option, since with handcuffs on, the dealer can't waste his items. Handcuffs work similarly. You can make him waste this item in the same way if it's his turn and there are multiple blanks left. But the benefit of the handcuffs is that he still wouldn't know what the bullets are, meaning that he still has a chance of shooting himself with a live round, even multiple times. A dealer's beers aren't used very well. A lot of the time he will use it over a blank round that he saw with a magnifying glass, basically wasting it. And if he has enough beers, he will completely waste handcuffs. There might be three left in the chamber, but he will still use handcuffs and then beer two of them since he is still guaranteed to use beers, unless he knows that the next round is live. Obviously, the beer is still the worst item. The beer can is a very complicated way to solve specific problems, which is why I see it as the most complex item, since the other items can save situations in a much simpler way. But stuff like this gives me a bigger appreciation for the beer can, even if it's still the worst item. But even with bad items, you still have the choice to use them over the good ones to save the good items for the next turn. I find it so cool that such a small set of items can be used so creatively in such a seemingly simple game. And the complexity doesn't stop there. There are probably a lot more situations that are solved in even more interesting ways. So next time you play, be creative with the items. Think about what the dealer will do after your move, or how you can stop the dealer from having a single turn. Think about the best case scenarios, or worst case scenarios. But Buckshot Roulette isn't always a game of strategy. A lot of the time, it's a game of... I've been talking about strategic combinations of items for a while, but sometimes your creatively intricate plan just doesn't work. It's a game of chance. It's not a puzzle game with one fully working solutions. You can't out-strategy bad luck. Anything goes with a game of chance. But even in a game of chance, you still feel like you're making correct or incorrect choices, even if there was no way you could know if that was true. The reason why is because the game only has initial randomness. Everything is randomly chosen from the beginning. Nothing is dynamically randomized. The bullets are randomly arranged, sure, but they stay in that arrangement for the entire round, meaning that your choice is the only reason the gun either shoots you or the dealer. But the randomness also makes the game very accessible. A lot of strategies can work just from dumb luck. This allows non-strategically minded players to also win, and win most of the time because of the fact that the game is designed to be... Bookshot Roulette is a single player game. The shotgun always faces the dealer for this reason. Not only that, you always go first. Always. Even after it reloads. It is incredibly unfair for the dealer. Even though it feels fair, like you're fighting against an equal opponent, the dealer can use all the same items, has the same amount of health, and can even make smart decisions like you. But he can only do that after your turn. In endless mode though, the dealer gains a new, big advantage. Sure, you are a lot more likely to win every individual round, but the dealer is in it for the long game. He waits, and waits until you make a mistake, or when bad luck finally catches up to you. And when it does, he'll strike. To win a round of endless mode, you need to finish at least three rounds. For the dealer to win, he just needs to win one. The house always wins. But going first is just to put the player more in control of the game. It's not fun to just be killed by an unstoppable AI. So before you get killed by an unstoppable AI, the game gives you some options. But the experience of the game wouldn't be nearly as strong if it weren't for the games. The music in Buckshot is actually pretty good. 
All the tracks make you feel something and work very well for their context. All the gameplay tracks make everything feel tense and heightened. The tracks changing between rounds keeps the feeling of progression, as well as help you separate each round from each other subconsciously. The music also gets very loud and weird when you get resuscitated, mimicking the shock of adrenaline and literal shock of getting brought back to life. But the music doesn't only make you feel tense, it's also sometimes sad. The song that plays when either yours or the dealer's defibrillators are cut feels like the end, but in a kind of bad way. The song of you driving back feels very somber and lonely, despite it being the winning screen. And even the main menu to an extent feels very distant and mystical. I really like it, but what I think is my favorite out of all of them is this one. The track is very jarring. The instruments feel like alarm bells, like you're waking up from a dream. Except you can tell just from the sound that it's not real life that you woke up to. But another thing that makes the music work so well is that most of it is diegetic. This immerses you into the world even more, but there are other things that contribute to the games. Everything you play in Buckshot Roulette is canon. All the mechanics in UI are all diegetic. There aren't any health bars. When you get shot, you are resuscitated and your health is shown through an in-game monitor showing you the amount of times you are able to be resuscitated. Items too are arbitrary. Items are used in the context of the in-game game of Buckshot Roulette. The only reason that the items work the way they do is because the dealer's game says so. Another example is dying. When you lose all your charges, this happens. Everything you do is canon, which gets you to connect with the world even more. There are also things in the game that make it feel more personalized. The most obvious is choosing your name, and that too is done in-universe. They could have made you type it in with your keyboard, but instead it's a cool looking snappy device that punches in your name with an attached keyboard. Another small thing is the fact that you get to put your items wherever you want. It would have been easy to just have them come out in a predefined order. But the small addition of choice of where to put the item is a nice touch. But the continuity also makes things like this... more impactful. You start to question weirdness like this because everything else is so seemingly grounded in reality. And I feel like this actually increases immersion even more, even though it breaks previously established impressions. But this only works because of the... The camera pans in, the barrel of the gun phases back into existence with a mysterious sound effect. The barrel could have just come back after you put the gun down, but that would make the game feel, well, gamey. Having it come back unannounced feels like it's an arbitrary action needed for the game to work properly. But the fact that an animation was put to show you this means that no, this isn't arbitrary, it is actually happening in-universe. This also teaches you that the knife doesn't work more than once. Almost every animation teaches you the mechanics. Sure, given how simple every item is, it's not hard to teach the mechanics. But Buckshot Roulette teaches the mechanics very vividly, usually using big camera movements. The camera will zoom in anytime something changes in the gameplay, making everything very readable. The vividness of the animations also makes every decision very impactful. The shakiness of your gun, the sharp crack of the magnifying glass, the aggressive grinding of the handsaw. It's ironic how dynamic and fluid the animation is, considering how you're just sitting at a table the entire time. Every animation feels intense, and the intensity is compounded by the main core of the gameplay, chance. Every animation has just a little bit of tension, since the entire game is tied to if the next bullet in the chamber hits or misses. This makes even watching the dealer's turn more tense, since you're hoping that he shoots you with a blank or uses an item wrong or anything to give you an upper hand. It also helps to pay attention so you know what the new bullet ratio is once it's your turn. Obviously, there are still times where it's just a guaranteed shot, meaning it's just a long cutscene before the inevitable hit. But even knowing exactly what the next round is, it's still nerve-wracking to point the gun at yourself. That's probably because you're relying on your own memory. There isn't anything showing you, as you shoot, that the next round is for sure blank. The fact that you have to rely on your own memory keeps some of the tension. Maybe you miscounted and that last round wasn't actually a blank. And this tension is exactly what makes this game a 
Buckshot Roulette has a lot of jump scares, specifically one jump scare, getting shot. It has a big loud noise and a flash on the screen before it fades to black. And despite this being a common horror game critique, the jump scares work. This is specifically because of the previously mentioned tension. The tension is built with the animations and the chance that it doesn't work, which makes hits even more impactful. But even when the shots stop scaring you, they don't become annoying because you know exactly when they can happen and have a lot of control over them. Eventually the shot just becomes an impactful way of showing you that you took damage. But even then the tension doesn't really go away. You're still playing roulette and relying on chance most of the time. But horror is shown a lot more clearly through the visual design of the game. Everything is very dingy and harsh, and the world is colored in this weird effect. It all feels very uninviting. And of course, the dealer. His design is very simple, but effective. Which is what makes him so clickbaitable. He has enough features to look like a person, but very obviously not human. But his visual design isn't the only thing that makes him scary or intriguing. He's the mastermind of the game. It's in his name, the dealer. Why does he run a game like this? Does he gain anything from this? Why does he play so fair? What is his... From what we have in the game so far, there aren't many details we can gather about the world. But there's just enough to pique some curiosity. The most obvious example is the contract signed by God. From the blood, we can assume that it didn't turn out so well for him. And this is also reinforced by the bad ending, showing that heaven isn't as well kept as it probably should be. We can strongly assume it's heaven given the name of the song that plays during the section. This brings up some cool questions and implications. The most pressing is, how powerful is the dealer if he's able to kill God? Maybe he's more than just a person. Weird blob thing. Maybe he's some sort of demon. He probably has some sort of powers given that when he breaks the magnifying glass, he doesn't open the shotgun to check like you. He just knows. It might be that he knows all the shots and just pretends to play fair. He's also able to chop the shotgun with one swipe using a handsaw. He's also not shown to use defibrillators, but that might just be an aesthetic choice. It is satisfying to see him lurk out from the darkness. He could be a demon of addiction. There are a lot of symbols of addiction, with examples like alcohol, cigarettes, and the game itself being a gamble on your life that you keep coming back to. Even after the bad ending, retrying keeps the timeline moving, meaning you come back even after death. It might even be that the dealer himself is bringing you back for another round, allowing your addiction to continue. He might even be the one taking control over heaven without God around. But why are you here in the first place? What do you need the money for? And from before, is there something up with the shotgun? Who's this guy? Why does he help you? Does he work for the dealer? Why is the dealer so fair? How did he kill God? Did he even die when you shot Who him? else played this game? Did you come back after is dying? The dealer you coming back after you death? First? Is God resurrecting you as a form of punishment? But... I'm just speculating. Maybe it's connected to the developer's other games, but I haven't played them to know anything. If you want to hear more about the story, then you can watch this video. There probably wasn't that much thought put into the story of a $1 game, but there's just enough to get me interested in what is actually going on in the world, to the point where I actually want to see The subtle questions and atmosphere makes me very curious about the world outside the confines of what is shown in-game, and apparently, I'm not the only one. There was a poll from the developer that showed that the most wanted feature was a proper story. This poll makes me very hopeful that there would be more added to the game. Despite the fact that most of the game is pure gameplay, the most requested feature was a story. That goes to show how well made the atmosphere and setting was. But I'm almost completely lost on how you continue a game like this. It was created as a very complete package with a strong beginning and a pretty definitive ending. Not that the ending explained everything, it just felt like the right ending. It's not a satisfying ending. When you finally kill the dealer, it's a bit anticlimactic. Especially if you misinterpreted what this meant, and many YouTubers did. But it also feels intentionally anticlimactic. You're not supposed to feel good about yourself. You willingly put yourself into this horrible situation, and for what? Money? Then here you go. That's it. The ending feels right. So how do you continue it? Or more likely, extend it? The way the game works makes it hard to see how you continue it. Continuing its gameplay makes it hard to progress a story, since you're just sitting in one room. But there is still opportunity for more. There could be more items to make the gameplay more interesting. Maybe items that will only affect the turn after you use them, or have an effect to steal an item or keep an item. But features like this have a short lifespan. The only way to keep it going is by adding more and more items, and eventually no one will really care anymore. I don't think it's necessary to add more to the core gameplay. 
Not that it isn't possible to add more good additions to the gameplay, just that I don't think it's necessary. But the most obvious way to continue the game is just by adding multiplayer. It's already designed as a two-player game, since both sides have the same tools and rules. This is a pretty easy way to increase the longevity of the game. It would also just be a fun addition. But of course, Mike could just work on a new project. This isn't his only game after all, he's made plenty. I don't doubt that he can't make any more cool games, so keep making games, Mike. Bookshot Roulette is a pretty cool game. I know it's not a very hard conclusion to come to, especially since the game being made on Godot automatically makes it a 10 out of 10. But yeah, you should probably get the game. It has a great amount of content for what it's worth. Now, despite all this talk, I'm really bad at the game. Seriously, I saw Heaven more than three times in my first playthrough, and my luck is still not much better than that. And I also like to say that I'm not like a super fan of the game. It's a really well executed game, and I look forward to whatever comes next, but I mostly made this video as practice for making a video essay style thing. I want to make more of this type of video for other games that I also really enjoyed. Now let's get the elephant out of the room. I made the script before the new update, and from what I can see from the new update, it's alright. I don't really have much to say about it. It probably won't happen, but if I make another video on this game, I'll wait until the multiplayer mode comes out. Last thing I'll say is, check out my game. It's called Internal. It's a first-person puzzle exploration game that uses an in-game VR headset to like solve puzzles and figure out the story and whatever. My friend and I made this game together. He made all the art assets and graphics. Hope you like the game if you decide to check it out. Steam page in the description. Thanks for watching.